Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be a pleasing offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, one thing I didn't realize, when you use this tablet, you kind of turn the brightness up, because outside it's not as easy to read. Well, today is the first Sunday after Pentecost, and you may have noticed it is a unique day on our calendar. It is the only holy day dedicated to a Christian doctrine. Isn't that exciting, everyone? Yeah. Now, of course, the choice of this day does make sense because Jesus Christ was revealed to us as the God of love who dies for us on Good Friday. And God the Father was revealed to us as the God of power who raises Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday. And God the Spirit was revealed to us as the God of presence who comes to us as the church on Pentecost, which was just last week. So you can understand, oh, that makes sense, kind of why today would be Trinity Sunday. Now, of course, the doctrine of the Trinity also does happen to be one doctrine uh, that confuses adherents of other faiths, and probably a lot of us as well. Followers of our fellow Abrahamic religions, Jews and Muslims, find the doctrine of the Trinity baffling. They think that Christians either are bad at math or they worship three gods. It's funny, if you ever ask them, they'll be like, what, 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 what is this with this Trinity thing? What the heck is that? Because how can you have one God and three persons? Now, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about why we developed this doctrine. It's not explicitly contained anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. And the Bible does talk about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in different places. And of course, the baptismal formula, which I read earlier in Matthew, uses the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which hints at some triad of sorts, but no real development beyond that. But our good forebearer in the faith, Friedrich Schleiermacher, talks about this in his major work of theology. He argues that the Trinity arose because the early church saw God as revealed as creator in the historical Jesus and in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit. They knew that they experienced God in these three different ways, but they also knew that there could only be one God. And so therefore that led to them understanding God as a triune God. The Trinity arose as an explanation for how the early church experienced God. But when you delve into the doctrine of the Trinity, you are bombarded with a bunch of Greek and Latin words, usia, hypostasis, persone, substantia. And even when the words are in English, you encounter words that are used in unique ways, like generation, subsistence, procession, and spiration. What the heck are all these words? And not unlike the major history major after his college graduation working at a fast food restaurant, you might begin to regret your life choices at this point and wonder, why the heck do I even care about this? Indeed, many of you might be wondering why you should care. Because this is a very complex concept. It's one that the church has argued about for nearly 2,000 years at this point, And the language adopted was that from Greek philosophy, which doesn't really align very well with modern ways of thinking. But I think that the image that we have, it, it can be very helpful to us as well. And the kind of trinity that I find very important is what's called the social trinity, which comes to us from the Eastern Orthodox. Social trinity envisions God as a community of three divine persons. God in this model is the bond that joins them all together. The word God, instead of being a person or a thing, is actually a relationship of persons. And this relationship is so close and so tight that when acting out in the world, all three are always operating in tandem with each other. 
This great love between the three of them is so pure and powerful that it overflows from the Trinity into the vast universe that the Trinity has created. And we can see how the bond of love between God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has led to the creation of this universe and the creation of human beings who can image this trinity and follow the triune model. Well, that all sounds fine and cool and in its own sort of way, but why should we care, right? What, that's, that's, that's talk for theologians. Why do we ordinary people care about this? Well, one reason I think we can care about this is because the doctrine of the Trinity actually can bring us comfort because it reminds us that God is love. You see, the Trinity emphasizes that point. In God's very being, God is love. God is love between these three persons. St. Augustine used the metaphor that God the Father is the lover. And God, the Son, is the Beloved. And the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between them. This model reminds us that first and foremost, God is for us. The triune God isn't some remote entity that's out there somewhere in the vast distance of space. The triune God is a bond of love that reaches out to us, that connects us to God and to each other. And that triune God loves us. God can seem so impersonal, but the Trinity reminds us that the triune God is at the very core love and relationship. And it is eternal love that knows no bounds, that has no limits, that cannot be confined to our language. But at the same time, language about the Trinity is also helpful because I think it reminds us that our human language has serious limitations when it comes to talking about God. The word God is this short little three-letter word, and it seems so simple and elementary. But of course, it's not. Just ask different people, what does the word God mean to them? And you will get a lot of different answers. And our little mammal brains can't really comprehend the infinite, which is what God is. We can't really describe God. And the doctrine of the Trinity reminds us of that fact. Is God one or is God three? Well, we say that God is both one and three. And that's not a cause for smugness, because it's a humble realization that we can't truly grasp God with our ideas or our words. The doctrine of the Trinity reminds us that we need to be humble since God is more than anything our words can attempt to describe. And I hope that in our humility, we might also make space for others of other faiths realizing that our understanding of God is our understanding, and it's not comprehensive. We can't fully comprehend God with our language. Now, Genesis 1 informs us that humanity is created in the image of God, and the doctrine of the Trinity can inform us about what it means to be human. See, God is a sacred community founded in love. God is unity in diversity. What a better image is there for human community? What better image is there for families, marriages, church? I officiated at my brother Dan's wedding 10 years ago now. And you know, I have to give my sister-in-law a little trouble, right? So she wants to know, well, ahead of time, what are you going to preach on? And I'm like, Sarah, I'm going to preach on the doctrine of the Trinity. And she's like, you better not. <laughs> and so when I started, she was like, oh my gosh, he's going to do it. But the reason why I used the doctrine of the Trinity was because I think that the idea of God is this relationship of co-equal persons is a great way to understand marriage and family and church. In God, we have this example 
of how to live together in community. And marriage, at its best, is an icon of that relationship in the divine. I mean, we are all made up of individuals with our own thoughts and identities, and yet we can all be brought together in our love and care for each other. Jürgen Moldmann argues that the Christ event is where the three persons of the Trinity come together once and for all to redeem creation. The Father is the revealer, the Son is the revelation, and the Holy Spirit is the act of revealing, to quote Karl Barth. The mission of the Trinity is laid out right there. Father sends the Son and the Spirit into the world, and this mission unites them as one. Likewise, we are created in the image of the Trinity. We can come together in our mission in this world. The Church is made up of disparate elements, different people who don't even all agree, but we can come together in our mission in this world. The bond of love joins us together no matter what. And that is something we learn from the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is the church's way to explain how God can be simultaneously creator, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit all at the same time. And it's not an easy thing to grasp. But for me, I rely on the model of the social Trinity because it is an understanding of God as a divine community of three persons united in love. And that understanding serves us because it gives us comfort, knowing that God is for us. God is love. It reminds us to be humble since human language can't really grasp all that God is. And at the same time, it's a model for us of what it means to truly love, to live in community, to live in unity and diversity. Amen.